Hey guys, this is Wave618. It's the 17th of January 2019. Um, we're going to do a, bit, a Bitcoin update today. Um, as well as that, we're going to have a look at Ethereum as, as well, just to keep on the cryptocurrency theme. But also, I would like to take a look at the equity markets also, just because there's a lot of volatility there. And what happens there could have a huge impact on other asset classes, including crypto. So we're going to be taking a look at that also. Uh, but we will be starting off with Bitcoin, looking at, first of all, the, the large account here, and then we're going to try and break down this consolidation that is happening here, where a lot of us are asking questions, is price going to go up or down from here? So that's the kind of questions that we're going to be looking to answer in this video. So if that's of interest to you, then stay tuned. Alright guys, let's get started. So we've got the Bitcoin chart here. We're on Bitstamp and we've got the daily time frame up and running. So uh, first things first. So we're just approaching 8 p.m. GMT right now on the 17th of January. And so, yeah, this is the, the long term Elliott Wave count that I've got here. So I've got this WXY count and that's a count that I've had for some time now. It was largely based on the kind of pattern that I saw playing out in 2014 during the crash there. And so far, it's really played out uh, the way we expected. So I was always forecasting wave Y to be a 0 0.382 extension of wave W. And you can see that if we just plot the, uh, the length of W there, extend it from where Y starts or where X finishes, and you can see we came down to that 3200 level. We did actually come down to, I think it's around 3130, so we went slightly through it. But um, you can see, you can probably appreciate that it came down to this level pretty nicely. And this is what the level that I was forecasting price to come down to. Um, and as I say, it was largely because of the 2014 play out, which those of you that have been watching my videos have broken that down and shown similarities uh, to that chart also. So that's the reason that uh, that bottom was predicted here. Now that said, we haven't seen a huge amount of volume come in at this level, but we'll talk about that shortly. First of all, just to further explain this count, so W is three waves down, quite clear to see. And then the X wave is the bit that people have difficulty seeing. So this is actually a descending triangle. So if we just uh, label that, make it a bit more clear. So we've got our, our A wave, B, C, D, and E. Um, so that's how it... That's how I would draw it. So the only thing that people ask questions about is this B wave not quite coming down to the base, but you don't have to see that. You only need two sides of the triangle to be, uh, you only need the top line of the triangle and the bottom line of the triangle to be tagged two, two times on either side. So you can clearly see it's hit uh, the top line uh, three times quite nicely. And at the bottom, it's been tagged here and here. So it meets all the criteria for that triangle pattern. So anyway, that's uh, the X wave. And when you've got your first two waves in an Elliott wave sequence, it then allows you to plot your pitchfork. So with pitchforks, what you do is you plot your first pivot at the start of W. In this case, it's a WXY. So you, st you start your pitchfork at the, the start of W, second pivot at the end of W, and then your second wave is the X wave, so you plot your third pivot at the end of the X wave. Then you get all these lines drawn out, and people uh, who have been following me, you'll see that I've got a few extra lines here. So the, the most important lines are this red line in the center here. This is your median line. Uh, and then the next important lines are this blue line here. This is your one standard deviation away from the median line. And you can see you've got that on either side. So here's the, the lower median line, upper median line. And then you've got what's called the upper warning line and lower warning lines. And these are two standard deviations away from your central median line. Okay, these are your most important lines. Now, what I've added in this video um, is just a few extra lines. Um, so this is the 0 0.25. So that's 0 0.25 standard deviations away from the mid, uh, median line. And you can see this is the, the exact opposite on the other side of the median line. Uh, then we've got the 0 0.5. Yeah, so you can see that on either side. And the reason I've added these on is because once 
when price is consolidating a lot, you'll find that these lines also get respected quite nicely. Now, I won't usually use these for taking trades, but it's good for helping to make sense. And you'll see, we'll have a look at what price is doing. You'll see that it is moving between these lines. We'll zoom in shortly and explain that. Uh, but yeah, this is the pitchfork. The variant of the pitchfork is a shift pitchfork. And the, re the only reason that you can tell that straight away, and the reason is it's because the median line is in the same vertical plane as the first pivot but it isn't originating from the first pivot. If it were to be originating from the first pivot, then we would call it the original uh, Andrews pitchfork. Yeah, but I can tell you straight away, just by looking at this, this is the shift pitchfork. The reason being is the median line originates not from the, uh, the first pivot, but actually it's the halfway point in the vertical plane between the first and the second pivots. And the other modification of a pitchfork is the modified shift, and for that one, you would actually find that the, um, the pitchfork originates halfway in the vertical plane between the first two pivots, which would be at this level, but also halfway in the horizontal plane between the first two pivots. So this distance here, so the horizontal distance between this pivot and this pivot. So you, it would basically originate from here. Um, but that's not the case. This is the shift pitchfork, which is a very... Uh, useful pitchfork for corrective patterns, corrective sequences. The basically the lines that you get are a lot more gentle in the slope um, than the original pitchfork. The original pitchfork or Andrew's pitchfork has much steeper gradient and it's used for more impulsive price action. Uh, so just by looking to see how price is adhering to the lines, it tells you really that. It's you know it's following the lines of a uh, of a shift pitchfork, which is seen more often in a corrective sequence, and so it just helps you validate that it is a corrective sequence when you see that it is adhering to these lines. And you can see here we've we've we came down all the way to the median line, um, which is there's basically an eighty percent chance of that happening. That's one of the rules with pitchforks. So once you join your first um, two or so first three pivots. So that's the third pivot there. Um, you can basically say there's an 80% chance that we'll go from here to the uh, median line. So and, and that's what we did. We hit our median line and we've actually gone through it. So we've really tested this median line. Now we're on the north side, the upside of this median line. And um, we'll decide, we'll, we'll have a, a close look at this and determine is this the bottom? Yeah, because that's one of the common questions amongst crypto Twitter right now. So we're going to have a, a good look at that. Um, also, one other modification I've made, you'll see this horizontal rectangle here. Uh, I did previously, and I think it was in my last video and all the a lot of videos prior to that, I was showing the daily order block, which actually came down to here. So I incorporated this. This, I believe, is the weekly order block. So if we go on the weekly time frame, it's more obvious. So basically what it does is it looks at the the contrary colored candle prior to the big move, uh, the big trend. So you can see here we've got our red candle that precedes our aggressive impulsive price action to the upside. And what happens is if you delineate the, uh, the boundaries of this, the body of this candle, so that's here and here, these levels act as good uh, support and resistance. Um, and the reason being essentially this or this level here, this is your it's your weekly open. Yeah, just remember the bodies of the candle are marking the open and the close. Now, the open and close, price will gravitate towards levels of value towards the, you know, or you'll start at the open and then at the close. So the opening price and the closing price are generally considered levels of value. Okay, so that's why you see that these prices are adhered to in the future. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here we found quite a bit of resistance at the top of this uh, order block here. And um, if we, we'll zoom in a bit and we'll see that we're actually finding price adhering to this, the lower portion of this order block right now. Um, okay, so I think on this, on the larger time frame, I've explained everything I need to. So what we'll do now, I think we'll zoom in a little bit. Let's go at least on the daily. All right. 
So as I was saying about these extra lines, you can see here now, so basically we, we surpassed the median line and we actually hit the 0 0.25 quite nicely. We then came all the way back up to the 0 0.5 on the, on the upside of the, uh, of the median line. And since then, we're really bouncing back and forth between the 0 0.5 and the 0 0.25, back and forth, back and forth. So currently, we're, we're at the 0 0.25, and we're also squeezed between two order blocks here. So we're at the bottom of this very significant weekly order block, which is this black order block. Um, we'll zoom in further and look at this a bit more closer. Um, but we're also, there's a, a smaller daily time frame order block. So I can show that if we zoom in a little bit here. So it is not the, the most significant order block, this. This is the basically the, the green candle here that preceded this last, last little move down. So this was a, a daily order block here. And you can see the top of this order block is now acting as uh, support here. So it is, I don't think it's such a strong level because look, um, the orders that were placed during this window here only took price this far. Yeah, so there weren't a huge amount of orders here. <coughs> so I don't think it's going to act as huge um, support or resistance. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw this, this uh, price level get broke to the downside. Um, it's not a, a significant level. As opposed to this uh, line here, which is a more significant level. And you can see here, it's, it's almost like a little bit of an inverse head and shoulders, though I wouldn't say it is just because of the, the volume. Um, usually you get a really high volume at the bottom here, so at this point we can probably stick volume on. And you can see, I mean, typically uh, with the head and shoulders or inverse head and shoulders, you'll get the highest amount of volume at the head here. But there's a big, obviously, uh, there's a lot more volume on this left shoulder than there is on the head. So it really invalidates uh, head and shoulders. That said, you, it could still be a corrective sequence and come up to here, uh, perhaps. At the moment, it's, it's, we're kind of in two minds as to whether that can happen. So basically, uh, to explain this further, we're going to have to zoom in. Let's go on the four hourly. And let's just take the volume off, clean this up a little bit. So basically, we had this... What I explained looks like a, an impulsive sequence. So I actually had this as a one, two, three, four, five. And the reason I gave it that count is just using Fibonacci levels. It seems to be fitting in uh, quite nicely with that count. And then we had what looked like uh, a corrective pattern. So we had this, uh, what looks like an A, B, C here. Um, and the question is, has that finished? So has that ABC finished? Well, first of all, from a Fibonacci retracement level, you certainly could argue that because we've hit the 0 0.618. So that's acting as really nice support. So as well as the top of this daily order block acting as support, we've also got the 0 0.618 acting as support. And that's why you can see prices holding up here and getting squashed between this weekly order block and this uh, daily order block, as well as the 0 0.618. On top of that, we've got the 0 0.5 here, also acting as resistance. Okay, so that's just from a FIB retracement level. And um, yeah, so this looked like quite an impulsive move down, corrective, then another impulsive move down. Has it finished? Very difficult to say. I, think, I mean, on the 15-minute chart, it's a little bit easier to look at. So I think in my last video, we did talk about the LA wave count here. And the reason I've labeled it this way, I've called this wave one, and then like an expanded flat pattern to make a wave two, and this is our wave three. And the reason I said that is because the fib relationship is very, very nice indeed. So this is our wave one, and then we extend that from where wave two finished. You can see we hit the 4.236 almost square on, and you can count five waves down in this third wave. So you've got a one, two, three, four, so that looked very regular to me. I, I did like that count. So that, that would be the wave three. And then since that, if you were going to say where your wave four was going to retrace to, well, you, you, you draw a retracement start from where your wave three starts, which would be here, 
finishes here, let's drag this across. Look at that, the wave 4 has retraced perfectly to the 38.2 retracement. So again, that's looking like a, a 335, which would be a, a an expanded flat here with the C wave going on beyond uh, the A wave and the B wave going beyond the wave 3. So that's all fitting in with an expanded flat type count there. Um, but then, if that's your 1, 2, 3, 4, then you expect an impulsive move down, and we just haven't really seen that. And it's because of these significant levels. I mean, we've hit the 0 0.618, we've hit the, the daily order block. Um, so we might get a failure pattern and start going up. That's one option. Um, alternatively, if you look at this, if you zoom out a little bit, let's go on the, the hourly. Let's take this fib off so it's a bit more easier to see. I mean, it's, it's a lot of sideways price action here. It's, it's looking like a block in itself. And typically what you, you get is, you know, you get your impulsive move down and then you get your sideways price movement. You would really typically expect another impulsive move down. I mean, that's the usual, uh, that's the usual sequence that you see. I mean, it's looking like a, a bear flag here. Um, so you'd have to lean towards a bearish count. Now that said, it, because it's quite an ugly uh, pattern that's playing out, it's not something I would trade. I would be sitting on the sidelines here. Um, but yeah, it, it could really go either way. I'm so so in uh, it's so in the balance that that's why I wouldn't really trade it. You know, you really want to be sure. You want to be you know heavily leaning to the bullish side or bearish side if you're going to trade. You know, you don't want to be sat on the fence, which is where I am at, at, at present. This could go really either way at the moment. Um, you can argue there's a potential short position here. We're back at this um, order block level. I suppose your stop might be here. This is really a day trade, um, we're, and we're going into the you know the late hours now. So that's not something that certainly is not something attractive to me. Um, and you've also got the the top of this order block and the 0 0.618, which offers another potential trade to the upside. But we've kind of moved away from that. So again, you, your risk reward has been lost there. So that's not the greatest trade either. Uh, I would be looking for a lot more price actions to come in to make a decision as to whether this is going up or down. Uh, so far, even from a, the pitchfork, we've also got support at this zero, um, This is the 0 0.25 here. Um, so we're really getting squashed. We've got the pitchfork, <coughs> we've got the order blocks, um, squashing price in here. And then we've got the, the Fibonacci retracement, the 0 0.618, also acting as support. Um, so I'm waiting for the, one of those levels to break before we can really decide. So, And that's going to happen soon. Um, we're running out of space here. Um, so I know that doesn't really give a lot of opportunity to trade, but that's essentially the message I'm trying to give here. There isn't a great opportunity to trade. We will look at Ethereum, but it's always good to look at a correlating chart when you can't see uh, the setup quite so clearly on one chart. Um, so yeah, this is a very important level. Uh, once this breaks, uh, we could just get a wave five again. I'd want to see this daily order block broken to the downside before saying that price is going to come down further. Um, now, even if it comes down further, you can still argue this is a corrective sequence. So it could come down to the 0.786. Uh, rather than the 0.618 and so we could still continue up the problem is here with Bitcoin is um, if, if we just look on the daily now just auto that and there's really not been a huge amount of volume come in however if when we look at Ethereum that's uh, a different situation altogether now okay yes there is volume that's come in since this you know a real lack of volume here but um, this is it's, it's tailing off volume here, yeah, which for me tells me that this is all very corrective. You know, if we we're marking out the bottom, you'd expect a huge amount, a big spike in volume to come in, especially at the, the very bottom around the 3100, where you know big orders should be made. Uh, unless obviously the dark pools are really being exploited here, and a lot of volume is being hidden. That's another way of looking at it. 
Um, but as I say, my, my major count, the WXY, was around to this level. Um, but yeah, we could. There's obviously a, a significant level at 3,000 where we obviously at it as uh, 3,000 at it as good resistance here, support here. So what I'm saying, what I have been saying, is that price could come down and tag the 3,000 level. That be that being the next major level of support. Um, so yeah, we do need a lot more price action to come in and, and give us a bit more information about that. At the moment, there's really only scalping opportunities, which don't interest me. That's not the way I trade. Uh, I do look for, I do day trade a lot, but I like day trades where there is a potential for a swing trade. Um, so basically, in that in such a situation, I'll day trade it, looking for an intraday trade, but I'll I'll probably take off maybe only 50% profits and leave 50% running uh, because of the opportunity for a swing. Um, I'm not seeing any real opportunity for that right now. There's a lot of indecision right now, so sitting on the fence at present. Um, but yep, as I said, let's look at Ethereum. So again, Ethereum. So I'm just going to explain this chart just from the long-term point of view, first of all. Um, again, it, it's showing a correction that looks to have completed. So I've got this WXY, and that might look really irregular, but that's only because we are on the log chart here. We just look at it on this. It, it looks a lot more regular. So that's your W, X, and another three waves down to make it Y. And you can see it's a really nice curved out bottom. You can see each low is getting, you know, it, in terms of, you know, it's not falling as dramatically, basically. And you can see it is starting to, even if it were. The question you can you can certainly argue that it, it's it's finished you know it's bottom you can certainly argue that just looking at it and there's a look at all there is a lot of volume that's come in around here that's the thing this is the difference with Ethereum and Bitcoin um, there's a, a a lot of volume down here at the bottom you know in comparison to what we've seen prior and uh, now back on our log chart so we can see a really really nice pitchfork. And generally with pitchforks, once you see a breakout of the warning line, <coughs> that helps to confirm that a downward trend is over. Because these pitchforks, what they're essentially marking out is trend. And you can see the upper warning line has been tagged a lot of times here, telling us that you know we're still in a bear market. Um, and yeah, so basically we tested the lower median line here. And we had confluence with this. This is a four hourly order block. So my blue boxes are always four hourly. So if we go on the 4 hour, you'll be able to see that this consolidation here, there was a lot of closing candles um, that offered support at the bottom here. And so we hit that really nicely. On top of that, we've hit the 94% FIB retracement. Not everyone would be familiar that that, that is a FIB level. And the, re the way you calculate these, if you keep doing the square root of 0.618, so the square root of 0.618 is 0.786, square root of that is 0.886, square root of that is 94. Or 94.16 so that's how you get them and um, so yeah we've hit that very very nicely now I do want to see a break of this upper warning line before we can be you know assured or you know more positive about you know the, the bear market being finished you know we haven't really seen that at present we're, we're just hovering at this upper median line oh another thing I wanted to show so there's a very nice one-to-one -one relationship with, between W and Y. So if this is W here, that's W, and extend it from where, just bring it across, extend it where X finishes. Okay, it's very sensitive. So, so you've got to plot it very perfectly, but you can see around that 82 level, you get your one-to-one -one relationship. So again, another reason why it looks like a corrective sequence may have, uh, you know, completed. And you can see a lot of, um, I won't go through it in this video, but a lot of the alts are starting to pop. And you often see that, you know, the alts will pop often before Bitcoin really bottoms. So Bitcoin could certainly make another low, whilst the alts might not necessarily make another low. That's certainly possible. Uh, Bitcoin is looking like it's going to, you know, accumulate a lot uh, really before it moves. Um, Ethereum fell 
a lot more dramatically. So again, coming up the log chart, look at you know the retracement's a lot more significant. You know, 94%. That only left 5% of price that it's not really broken into. Um, yeah. So back on the log chart, and yeah, let's have a look, a quick, quick look on the four hourly. So in fact, the hourly might be even nicer. Let's take off the volume a moment. Now, just determine the Elliott wave count here. So, if this is a wave one and two, it's, it's not the greatest count just because, you know, if you further break down the sub wave count, I mean, that's looking at like a wave one, two, three, and then that's a huge wave four. Is it some kind of diagonal? Can't really see it, to be honest. Um, unless this is a wave one and then this is an a b c expanded flat that's another way of looking at it i suppose but let's just forget the sub wave count you know you can always criticize a count by going you know into detail looking at the sub wave count but if you just do a fib if that was our wave one up to there and extend that you can see it hits very nicely or just fails to reach the 4.236. So that's a, a very good Fibonacci ratio extension there, um, which tells us that's probably the end of a wave three. And then this could all be a wave four that we're in right now. And if it is, it's looking like a regular flat with a three waves down here, three waves up, and then a five waves down. So that's a one, two, three, four, five. So this level would really need to hold if this is gonna be the end of a wave four. And then we'd expect price to go up perhaps, you know, break out of this upper warning line. At the moment, again, we're in a very indecisive phase here. So this really needs to hold um, if it is going to be the end of a wave four. So that's how I'm looking at uh, Ethereum at this moment in time. Um, so yeah, that's looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum. I did say that I want to look at the stock markets also. Now, first thing, uh, we'll pull up the NASDAQ. And let's just go on the weekly. So first of all, I want to say thank you to someone. I can't remember who it was, but they actually pointed out that my pitchfork was plotted in the wrong way. So I'm really grateful that they pointed it out. I had plotted it correctly on the, the S&P and the Dow Jones, but for some reason I plotted it incorrectly on the NASDAQ. I think what I did, I said this was my first wave. When wave two was a running flat, so that's, a wave, that's wave one. Wave two was an A, B, C. So that, this is the correct place to place your third pivot, but I had actually plotted it there, I think, uh, which would have been the wrong place. For me, I, not everyone does it, but I like to plot my pitchforks using the Elliott wave count. So with my wave two finishing here, this is where the third pivot should be. And the reason this is my count, I'll go over it. So if you look at the wave one here and extend that from where wave three starts, which is at the end of wave two, you can see very nicely we come up Nice 2.618 extension, very, very nice and regular. Then we get a very nice correction, looking like uh, a regular flat there. And the way you plot your wave five often is you look at the, the Fibonacci relationship between waves, so the genesis all the way through to wave three. And then if you extend that from where wave four finishes, and we've got a one-to-one -one relationship. So there's a good reason to say that potentially you've got a nice five wave count up there. Now, since then, you can see that on this, uh, since I've you know adjusted the pitchfork, you can see we haven't actually broken this lower warning line. <coughs> so we're still very much technically in an up uptrend. Yeah. So until this is broken, you can't really say the the bull market is over. Um, but that said, we came down quite dramatically, and we could still you know break below. That's still uh, possible. Uh, you can see here on the S&P, I've drawn the same thing. So again, correct pitchfork drawn here. So this is our wave one, running flat wave two, uh, three up to here, four, five. And again, we've come down to test this lower warning line and seen a bounce. The Dow Jones is slightly different. So here, this is since, you know, this is where we drew our pitchfork from on the NASDAQ and S&P from the post-credit crunch. Um, recession and 
you can see again we've slightly breached the low volume line of this pitchfork um, but it's actually this longer time frame pitchfork and if we'll have to go on the monthly to see this so this is dated all the way back to the post um, Great Depression here and you can see we've I've added, added an extra line so as I say usually I just look at the, the one standard deviation two standard deviations I've added the 1.5 reason being is we hit it really nicely uh, if we zoom in using this so this thin blue line this is your 1.5 on that large pitchfork so we hit that really nicely and since then we've come down um, and that's as well as hitting the median line of this shorter pitchfork dated back from the credit crunch recession um, so there's a bit of a confluence there of pitchforks which subsequently led to this uh, correction now one other um, benchmark I want to show you, uh, which is a lot more volatile, is the Russell three, uh, 2000. So this is very important to look at because it often a collapse in the Russell will often precede a collapse elsewhere. You can see in two, 1st of June 2007, that's this candle here. This Since that high was formed, we just came tumbling down for the recession. So, that, so that, basically the Russell told us this, 1st of June 2007. But if we look at the other benchmarks, so NASDAQ, so here it was November 2007, yeah, so it's delayed. Um, <clears throat> S&P, what did that tell us? So that S&P, October 2007, and the Dow Jones, also October 2007. So what I'm saying is the Russell told us beforehand, okay? So yes, it, it came down and it, it did come back up in October, but unlike the others, the the Russell went sideways. So it, it just formed another, I don't, I don't think it quite came up to the same level as the June, June high, um, and then it rolled over. So a bit of a divergence, you could say, uh, between the, the benchmarks. <clears throat> so basically, the Russell 2000 is following the lower cap uh, company. So it makes sense, actually. The, the lower caps are more likely to represent what's likely to, to be happening in the economy because then they don't have as much support from the media as the, the, you know, the blue chip stocks, which are represented in your, your bigger um, exchanges and indices, such as your NASDAQ, S&P, Dow Jones. Uh, they can often be supported even when economic environment is, you know, really dismal. They can be supported by the media. Yeah, you can still get a lot of retail money flooding in um, just through the media. Now, the Russell isn't really supported in that sense. You know, the media is not going to support these lower cap uh, companies. And as a result, they show when the you know weakness is really happening. Now, what's happened here in the Russell, we've actually breached quite quite a bit beneath this uh, lower warning line and at present we're, we're testing it and this is why I think this is a very very crucial time because I want to see whether this lower warning line really holds and I mean significantly holds um, so certainly it could breach you know come back above the warning line but I want to see if it holds now I've drawn this this is a monthly or oh no, that's a weekly order block so if we're on the weekly so I basically what I've done here this green candle here preceded this down move. So that was how I draw this weekly order block. So I delineated that uh, candle there with the, the open and the, the open here and the close. And so I do think that we could potentially test, first of all, this level at around 1484. First, technically, we could come up to 1536, or we could come into the 50% level, which often acts as uh, resistance. And the reason I say that is because if we go on the monthly, there is in fact a monthly order block. So if we look at the green candle on the monthly, the open is around 1506. So there's a very, and the higher time frame is generally more significant. So that 1506 is certainly a level I'm looking at on the Russell. I want to see if price can break above that. If so, then it's a, a show of, for me, that's a show of strength for the general economy you know, a good close above 1506, particularly a monthly close, um, so towards the end of January. Um, but if we fail to really, you know, 
uh, get above that 1506 level, then for me, that's a show of weakness for the economy. And it could be, as I say, the Russell generally, you know, gives us a better indication of how the economy is doing because it's not going to be, you know, supported by the media as much as your, you know, your big indices such as NASDAQ, uh, Dow Jones, S&P, etc. So that's just what I wanted to show you really on the uh, equities front because that is really going to tell us what's going to happen in the crypto. You know, if there's a, a huge panic, there's going to be a general uh, big sell everywhere. You can argue that a, a safe haven could potentially be crypto. Reason being is it's completely, you know, we're at such low levels and it is an argument it can't really come much lower. So it could be a good safe haven considering it has a lot of promise in the future. It answers a lot of um questions you know about the you know the integrity of the banks uh, right now so uh, yeah it's something that sounds very promising could be revolutionary and it's at low prices so that could potentially be a safe haven um, and you'd expect a lot of negative media around crypto during that time so why would you why would you expect that negative media because it acts as li liquidity for the large operators to put their long positions. So you need retail traders selling, or the, the, the large operators need retail traders selling in order to put their uh, long positions in uh, at good price levels. So, yeah, so these are the key things that I'm looking at for. The, so as I say, Russell is what I'm really looking at for equities. And at the present, so Bitcoin is in a bit of a, no man's zone at the moment. Uh, need to see more price action coming in. We've got a few potential catalysts coming up. So, um, yeah, we've got backed coming up. I think that's, uh, when is that? I think it's 24th of this month. But that said, backed, I don't see it acting as a massive catalyst because that's not like a black swan event. Generally, catalysts that are going to bring something unexpected that haven't been filtered into the chart or priced into the chart already are what really influences uh, price. So, for example, the ETF, if that was all of a sudden approved, that is something that could make price move significantly. Uh, but that is something that is, you know, generally guaranteed to uh, be put in place uh, at that time. So it's not really going to come as a surprise to anyone. I don't see price suddenly jumping. Yes, it could give potentially some more integrity to... Uh, crypto, uh, seeing it wide, more widely used, perhaps uh, more in, in more shops, and um, <clears throat> yeah, then it has a bit more intrinsic value behind it, but it's going to have a slow, slow effect, um, so it's not a major catalyst, that one, either. but then, the, the, yeah, there is a bigger catalyst, the 24th of February, I believe, is when we're going to rediscuss the ETF, uh, so that could potentially be a catalyst, so we've got another month or so to wait for that one. Um, but yeah, we've got a few futures contracts on the SIBO and CME coming up. Um, so sometimes you get a bit of volatility. That might be enough to you know, cause us to break out of this very, very corrective sequence that we're seeing right now. Um, so yeah, we should find out pretty soon over the next few days. So these are, we're in a tight range here. I want to see, you know, will this level get breached, retested and move up? Or will we come down lower? And that will give us a a much better idea but either way if we are coming down lower i'm still not interested in shorting um as i say 3000 is a very um is a, is a very good support level and i want to see more volume really before getting quite excited about a long trade um but yeah i think i'll wrap it up there i think we've been going on rambling on quite a while and well done if you've managed to watch this far i'm um, hoping i've given some you know useful food for thought um yeah, with regards to my course, for those of you that are interested, I've got a 50% uh, deal on at the moment, which I'll post it in this video but uh, in the details, but also on top of that, it's on Twitter, it's on my pinned tweet. I think it expires tomorrow, probably around midnight GMT. Um, so if you're interested, check it out. Basically, my strategy is based on a confluence of three indicators, which are pitchforks, order blocks, and Elliott Wave. Um, I think they're an excellent way of marking out where price is likely to go because they're looking at completely different things. Elliott Wave is looking at sentiment. Order blocks are looking at price. 
pitchforks incorporate time as well as price. Uh, so the non-conflicting indicators, and I find that you know a confluence of those is a very powerful tool. <coughs> in particular, at uh, Catalyst. So if, if actually you check out, I've, I've made a tweet. I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before. It was regarding the the Brexit deal uh, vote. But that was an absolute classic example of how I would apply my strategy. Check it out. I explained it in you know quite good detail where I showed the pitchfork, Elliott Wave, and Order Block all coming into play at the same time, as well as the catalyst. So that's a very very powerful um, indicator, and it subsequently moved 200 pips in an hour, and I think it probably did about 50% of that move within about five minutes. So it was very very um, significant and worked out very very nicely um, so yeah as I say if you want to learn more that course is going cheap for until tomorrow midnight so check it out there otherwise yeah until next time take it easy guys all right gonna wrap it up